familiar with City Pop, you may be already familiar with the name Nakahara Meiko. If not, allow me to briefly explain what City Pop is. In the 1980s, Japan was in what's called a bubble economy. Long story short, it meant they had a lot of money. With this era came a lot of creations, one of these being new modernized synth pop music. Ironically, back then, Japanese people called it new music. It's still called new music today, not city pop. That's actually a name given to it in the West. While a lot of that 80s Japanese money went to promoting Showa idols, a thing that was also quite huge back then, new music was classified as more of the chill yuppie jams for young adults to listen to while they drove on the freeway or went on a classy dinner cruise. The latter was also very popular in 80s Japan. City Pop is not solely a creation of the 80s, however. To quote Google, City Pop is a loose category of Japanese pop music that emerged in the late 70s and peaked in the 80s. In Japan, the tag is simply referred to music that projected an urban feel and whose target demographic was urbanites. So, where does Nakahara Meiko fit into all this? Well, she created a lot of banger tracks during this time period and even supplied a couple equally banger anime openings. Any fan of Dirty Pear or Kimagure Orange Road does not need to be told that. Nakahara is a staple of the definitive city pop catalog today, and was very popular back in that day as well. Nakahara's established presence would change drastically in 1992, however, when she would never be seen publicly again. Nakahara Meiko has not been seen in 30 years. You heard that correctly, the year 2022 marks three full decades since her disappearance. And so, without further ado, let's look into the disappearance of Nakahara Meiko. Let's start at the beginning. Nakahara Meiko was actually born Kohara Akiko on May 8th of 1959. She was born in Yotsukaido Shi or Yotsukaido City located within Chiba Prefecture. Her family supposedly ran a fuel shop. Nakahara had a passion for songwriting since she was a child and began working on original music compositions in junior high school. It was at the age of 15 that Nakahara entered to perform on a music competition show. This was Kimi Koso Sutada, which translates to You Are the Star. This show ran from 1973 to 1980 and is very similar to the more well-known star Tanjo. Nakahara, unfortunately, did not receive enough points to proceed and win the competition. Nakahara's father was strongly against her pursuing a career in music and preferred that she attend college instead. This did not deter Nakahara and honestly good for her for not giving up, that's incredibly admirable. And she later went on to study music at a school ran by singer Kunihiko Suzuki. Because Nakahara already had some experience in songwriting, she chose to focus on studies geared towards becoming a vocalist to broaden her skill set more so. At the age of 17, Nakahara began finding work as a backup vocalist. She saw success working on TV stations, but among her biggest breaks at the time was singing backup vocals for Hiromi Go, a 70s teen idol turned prominent musician who has an extensive and well-known discography in Japan. As Nakahara became older, her voice also began to achieve a more mature and husky sound. This shift led Nakahara to begin performing as a solo vocalist. It was in the early 80s at the Shinjuku Ruido K4, a well-known live house in Kabukicho Ward of Tokyo, where representatives at Toshiba EMI discovered her. Rewinding a little bit though, the Shinjuku Ruido is a very well-known live house and a very cool spot. The late Yutaka Ozaki, a very well-known Japanese musician, actually debuted there in 1984. To my knowledge, it still exists and there's a few other locations throughout Tokyo. Back to 1982, though. Toshiba EMI took her under their wing and dubbed her the second Yumin. Yumin being the nickname of Matsutoya Yumi, a famous singer and songwriter who also has a very low and distinctive voice, much like Nakahara. It was after Nakahara's discovery that her very first single was released in 1982. This was when she was 22 years old. The single was called Konya Dake Dance Dance Dance. In the same year, her first album was also released. It was titled Coconut House. 1982 specifically was a very big year for Japanese pop music as the shift from more traditional sounds to something more modern became more apparent and mainstream. What other artists debuted in 1982? 
Well, to name a few, there's Matsumoto Iyo, Nakamori Akina, Hori Chiemi, and Hayami Yu. These were huge names at the time, particularly Akina, who dominated the Oricon charts throughout the 1980s. Matsuda Seiko did too, of course, but she debuted back in 1980. From here, Nakahara continued to see success and growth as an artist. Her main demographic was meant to be girls in their late teens to early 20s, a demographic that the girl next door Showa idols of the time didn't entirely appeal to. This appeal was seen by Kanebo, a Japanese cosmetics company who took advantage of Nakahara's mature image. This cosmetics ad featured her song Kimi Tachi, Kiwi, Papaya, Mango Dane. That's kind of fun to say. In Japan, this is the song that people best remember her for. The distinct Latin influence, as well as the brass use, make this song stand out quite a bit among the other songs at the time. At the time, it truly cemented her as a musical artist and made her a household name. And let's not forget her talent as a songwriter. Nakahara has written the majority of the songs she performs and even wrote music for Hayami Yu. This newfound fame made Nakahara very busy. Her schedule was often packed with new projects and she barely had any free time for herself. In 1985, one year after the Kanebo promotion, Nakahara performed the song Roro Roshian Ruretto. This song was used as the opening to the 1985 anime Dirty Pair. And let me tell you, this one is a certified hood classic, my friends. It slaps pretty dang hard and is probably my favorite song by her. Despite the fact that I can barely say it, because borrow words, I hate them. The song is the opening to the original 1985 Dirty Pair anime, not, not the one after that. She also sang Space Fantasy, the ending song for Dirty Pair. It's about two girls who fight crime in space and also has roots in Japanese female wrestling as it's what inspired the creator of Dirty Pair to create Dirty Pair. Completely unrelated, but a weird fact I wanted to share. It was also in 1985 that Nakahara released Meiko TV, a laser disc featuring 45 minutes of various music videos. Next came two songs for the anime Kimagure Orange Road. It's about a family of psychics, but focuses more on romantic love triangle teenager shenanigans. That being said, it's pretty good. The two songs are Kagami no Naka no Actress and Dance in the Memories. They were featured as the opening and ending theme songs for episodes 37 through 48. Dance in the Memories was also used in two episodes of the OVA. These mention promotions and theme songs aren't the only ones Nakahara created. Nakahara lended her voice to both dramas and commercial campaigns as well. This was the highest point in Nakahara's career. Between 1982 and 1988, she created 14 singles, 8 full albums, that laser disc I mentioned previously, and even a damn record, which is a special recording intended for use in a karaoke machine. It's speculated that, at this point, Nakahara's busy schedule began to take a toll on her. The years 1984 through 1988 were incredibly successful for her, and she created a lot of great music during this time period. It was in 1988, however, that she would make a big decision that would drastically steer the direction of her life and career. Kagami no Naka no Actress was Nakahara's final album before a short hiatus. It was released on March 5th of 1988. Among the very few details surrounding Nakahara's personal life include her move to New York. The move is speculated to have occurred in 1988. This is according to this Japanese article I had found. Some articles list the year as 1990, but 1988 makes more sense considering her discography and this is when she took the break. Nakahana had visited America prior to 1988. This is seen in a picture taken in Chicago in 1984. But yeah, it's probably 1988 when Nakahana moved to New York. It is uncertain for how long she stayed there, though her 1990 album, 303 East 60th Street, features photographs taken in New York. 1990 is the year Nakahara actually returned from that first hiatus. This being considered, she could have been living in New York as she resumed her music career at this point in time. That Japanese article also claims Nakahara is back in Japan now, but this may not still be the case depending on when this interview actually took place. She may still be based in New York or may go back and forth, but this information is completely unknown. Between the years 1990 and 1992, Nakahara Meiko released a decent amount of new music. 
opens the 303 East 60th Street album and her 1991 album, On the Planet, Events of the Earth. She also released one more music video for the song, Distinguished Diamonds, Is It True Love? This song was used as the 1990 opening theme to a travel show that ran on TV Asahi at the time. When Nakahara was 32 years old, she would begin what would be her final tour. Well, some sources call it a tour, though her Japanese Wikipedia page lists it as a performance in the Nisin Power Station, which was a live house located in the basement of Nisin Foods. This company is known for their instant ramen. Not, not music. All joking aside though, it was a weird little juxtaposition. Honestly, sounded like a really cool spot, though I don't think they had an actual audience. They just recorded music from that location and broadcasted it. Still a cool spot nonetheless though. <laughs> now, to my knowledge from my own personal research, I don't believe this was labeled as a farewell show or made to landmark any kind of retirement from the industry. Though basically, once the show ended, so did Nakahara's 10-year career as a vocalist. After this, Nakahara went radio silent, as far as any public activity goes, that is. Radio silent for the past 30 years. It is now 2022. At this point, Nakahara Meiko is currently 62 years old. Where Nakahara is and what she is currently doing remains completely unknown. I have, however, come across various details throughout the internet that suggest where she may be and what she's been doing all these years. Some of these come from decent sources, others are comments I've seen here and there around the internet that may not hold very much weight. Regardless, I'll present my findings here and now. Though, let's actually just pause for just a minute. Before I get into this, Nakahara Meiko's privacy is something that should be respected. I did not attempt to get in contact with anyone who may know her through private messages, like her relatives or friends and such, or previous co-workers, management, and I simply made use of information that has already been made available online. I think this is something that should already be inferred by everyone watching, but please do not contact people you believe she is associated with personally looking for more information. Anyways, moving on. So, where is she now? Well, we do know Nakahara has a history of songwriting. I mean, she did write much of her own music. Various sources have listed two specific artists that Nakahara has wrote music for. These two artists being Vivian Su and the girl group Chekiko. Vivian Su has been active since 1990 and remains active today. Nakahara wrote the song Hachigatsu no Valentine for Su. Chekiko was only active for a short time, that being 1998 to 1999. For this group, Nakahara wrote lyrics to the song Animaru-sama no Natsu Gakuru. Chekiko has returned for two short reunion shows in 2004 and 2009, however. Nakahara has written music for a number of artists over the years, though I have read around the internet that she has also written music under aliases. I have heard that she's written music for films as well, though I cannot confirm this as it's all hearsay. But anyways, web pages I have stumbled upon say she stopped writing music for Vivian Sue in the early 2000s. I'm not sure if this suggests that she stopped writing music entirely for people at this point or not. There is also a cover band that is dedicated to Nakahara's works. The most notable one is Lodos, a tribute band named after one of Nakahara's albums. Among the members of Lodos is a musician who goes by the name Megu. This member runs a personal blog online, and it's within this blog that some of the most substantial information in recent years is provided. While the band Lodos does have its own personal social media and blog dedicated to the band functions itself, the blog in particular, which has all the good stuff, is a line blog ran by Megu. It's her personal blog and has quite a few posts relating to Nakahara Meiko. Megu appears to be actively involved in looking for updates when it comes to how Nakahara is doing currently and will post new discoveries. I've also read on a Kaio Kyoku blog that this band actively searched for Nakahara in the late 2000s. One post in particular details how she recently came in contact with one of Nakahara's relatives who came out to see one of Lodos's shows. According to this relative, Nakahara is alive and well and currently residing in Tokyo. Beyond this, not a whole lot was shared by the relative, it seems. 
This was likely an effort to respect Nakahata's privacy, which is completely understandable. Though beyond this, there have been other updates. Upon researching, I was able to come into contact with people who run other blogs and engage in Facebook groups that update fans on Nakahata's whereabouts. It's within a Facebook group that I was able to come across yet another update. A very recent update from 2021. See, we've considered the possibility of Nakahata being in New York. We've seen comments stating she's back in Tokyo. But what if these are both incorrect? What if Nakahata is in neither of those places? What if Nakahata Meiko has moved back to Chiba Prefecture? See, this user apparently sent a private message to Lodos last year. In this message, a member of Lodos, I believe Megu, says that Nakahara is living happily in Chiba and that they are not currently involved in music in any way. The response also says to kind of take this with a grain of salt as this information was obtained from person to person and is simply what they've been told. It has not been confirmed by Nakahara herself. I've noticed some fans garnering somewhat of a romantic image of this possible outcome. Maybe Nakahara took over her family's fuel shop and she's living a happy and peaceful life back in her hometown. Really though, none of these have been proven to be true just yet. And I don't see any reason for any of these statements to be false. These blogs and community interactions provide the most substantial recent information available. If any of it proves to be true, then I feel that it's the news a lot of fans wanted to hear. After all, none of it is bad news. In conclusion, I think, while not something I can confidently confirm, Nakahara Meiko is likely alive and well. Her work in the industry is all done behind the scenes following her departure from the public eye in 1992. Looking at how the busy lifestyle of a singer took a toll on her in the mid-80s and how she came back to create music publicly after that 1988 hiatus, only to retire completely, I think it's safe to conclude that she left the public eye simply because it was just too much. Being in the public eye like that and working yourself to the point of exhaustion can no doubt take a toll on one's mental health, even physical health. If this was the case for Nakahara, then I greatly respect her decision to leave the public eye. It's admirable and I hope she found more happiness and a more fulfilling career in the years following 1992. Will we see a public appearance from Nakahara again in the future? Well, that's entirely up to Nakahara to decide. It's completely up to what she feels comfortable doing. Her record label is still Toshiba EMI and re-releases and compilations of her music have been released in recent years through them. This includes four different best of albums. The last seeing a release in 2005. This information does not say a whole lot about any new projects, however, simply that she has the same record label still. If Nakahara Meiko did happen to be watching this video, I'd tell her this. Nakahara Meiko-san no ongaku no fan ni natte kara 10 nen hodo tachimasu. Nakahara-san no ongaku ni wa teenage no muzukashi jiki ni tasugete itadakimashita. Nakahara Meiko-san no ongaku ni wa kokoro kara kansha shiteimasu. Honto ni arigato gozaimashita. I recall buying a compilation CD of hers on Amazon when I was about 17 years old. I still have it actually. When I was just learning to drive in my first car, a crappy 2001 Chevy Malibu, I would listen to that CD for hours. It was quite literally the soundtrack to that time in my life as I practiced driving for hours on end in preparation for taking my driving exam. Nakahara's music has a special place in my heart for that reason. So, what about you guys? What city pop artists really strike a chord with you? Who is your favorite artist and what is your favorite city pop track? Why do you like them? What draws you to them? Please let me know in the comments, I'd really love to hear from you. As for myself, I'm pretty partial to Bay City and Shyness Boy myself. I also love literally everything that Tatsuro Yamashita creates. 
Also, After Five Clash has the most aesthetic album cover I have ever seen, and I want nothing more than to obtain one of the vinyl records for my personal collection. I mean, just look at him. Look at this dude. What a king. Anyways, that is all for today. I look forward to seeing you all in the next video, and I really hope you enjoyed this little deep dive research thing of mine. Anyways, bye for now.